Hi, it's Rob Moore here, and we're streaming live at an event. I'm not going to touch the camera because it's taken me 20 minutes to set it up. But you might recognise this man here. It's Gerald Ratner. Gerald, do you want to say hi to everyone? Hi, everybody. And uh, this is Rob. And for about the next 30 minutes or so, we have an audience of about 5,000 people. Um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's still 200 odd. Uh, and they're going to ask Gerald and maybe myself some questions about business, about challenges, about rising again, about, you know, scaling, about retail businesses, about online, whatever they want to ask myself and Gerald. And if you want to ask some questions live as well, please do. Let's do it. Who's going to ask the first question? Stevie, what's your name, sir? Hi, Stevie. Hi, Stevie. Stevie, you're going to need a microphone because you're live. Your mum's watching. <laughs> she likes your hair. <laughs> um, question for Gerald. Um, you seem really calm in your demeanor. Um, have you always been a kind of calm person, or is it because of what you've been through and what you've experienced that's made you like this? Or... Uh, no, I think that uh, I was the exact opposite of calm for all those years. And I had you know, a huge amount of drive. Uh, doesn't necessarily make you happy, uh, that pursuit of success and money. Um, some people, I think it was Einstein that says, you know, you're better off leading a life of harmony, uh, not pursuing success. Which I don't agree with, because I got a huge amount of pleasure uh, building the business. And it is a bit of a gamble when you're buying businesses and you're, you're taking risks. And it's that gamble that really, I found really exciting. And I was anything but calm. I was a nightmare, you know, I couldn't wait for a lift. But, you know, I did lose everything. And then I made it, some of it back. My business today is nothing like the size of the original business. But it has made me uh, a much more balanced person, in a way. And it, I want, without wanting to sound too cheesy, I do appreciate the success and the money that I have got second time around much more than the first time. So I have come full circle. And I am, as I said, I am happy. I know my face, I can't help my face, I don't look happy. <laughs> but I am genuinely... Um, Smart the camera. Come on. Yeah, I am genuinely much, much happy. I always give the example of the guy that, you know, has worked all his life and uh, eventually bought a Jaguar at the age of 55 or 60. He's probably going to enjoy it more than somebody who's got a Ferrari when he's only 30 or something like that. You know? <laughs> That would be me. Yeah, that's you. Um, I think money makes you really happy. <laughs> <laughs> Good question, Stevie. Who's next? Right behind, pass the mic right behind you. Oh, we went back. What's your name, sir? Thank you. Chris. Hi, Chris. Hey, Chris. Hey, Chris. Hey, Chris. Gerald, who's been the most positive influence in your life and how? Well, if you read my book, my wife, my <laughs> wife did me an enormous favour by threatening to kick me out. Uh, which she's done a few times over the years. So, yeah, sometimes you do need to kick up the arse, you know, especially when I was doing nothing and gave up and believed everything that was said about me in the press, that I was unemployable and useless. Um, but if you, without wanting to plug my book, uh, which I wouldn't dream of doing, um, I did used to play snooker with a guy called uh, Michael Green and Charles Saatchi. And Charles Saatchi, uh, although he's had a bit of bad press in his time as well, uh, also, probably a bit unfairly. Although I don't, bl I don't blame the press for the bad press that I've had. It's probably my own fault, being a bit arrogant. <laughs> so, uh, you have to say that, you know, because uh, it sounds good. But <laughs> <laughs> really, I hate them. Uh, but he, he just taught me basically that you can do anything. I mean, he made a huge amount of mistakes, and he tried to buy the Midland Bank, if you remember, and, that, you know, everyone criticised him for that. It was ridiculous. As an advertising agent, why'd you buy a bank? But that was the sort of attitude he had. And he taught me in the 80s, when we were playing snooker, that anyone can achieve anything. And he was achieving it, and I wanted to achieve it. So I thought, my, compared to my little business of what he was doing, uh, I wanted to be like him. So, you know, I think it's often good to surround yourselves with successful people like Rob, obviously. Um, uh, about at least four times in Gerald's book pops up conversations you have with Michael and Charles playing yeah. snooker. It's quite a common theme within the book. And I'm, I'm playing uh, Paul with Brian afterwards. I think it's great to, to have something like that you do with people who are your peer or even a little bit above you. Because if they're a little bit above you, then you get, um, you know, the, you've got the best place, haven't you? Because you learn more. I just think that's really important. 
And if you can merge your friends with your business associates, so you've got your passion profession merge, and you hang around interesting people and you, you're both pursuing a business and you understand each other, or three of you in Gerald's case, I think that's a great thing to do. Um, you, you're also much more relaxed when you're doing a sport like something like that and you have a much more sort of uh, honest conversation. Much more comes out, I think, over a snooker table than sitting in a boardroom being all sensitive. <coughs> All right, so we're going to go, next question, we'll go this side this time, yeah, right at the back, you saw in the green top. Hiya. What's your name, sir? Uh, my name's Simon. Hi, Simon. Hi, Simon. Hi, everybody. Uh, Joe, in your, in your darkest days when this shit really hit the fan, were you ever suicidal? Uh, yes. I was, uh, I was, was reading this book, of Joan Rivers, who said that, Suicide, so 80s, so that put me off the idea of, uh, of doing it. But in all seriousness, and sorry to bring in a damp note, I did actually go to a psychiatrist because here I was running this huge business, getting the most fabulous press and every, you know, I just thought I could walk on water, which is a huge mistake in itself, believing your own publicity. But there I was with my helicopter and plane and houses and everything. And then a minute later, I'd lost absolutely everything and had huge tax bills and debt. So, and it wasn't the money, and everybody says it's not the money, it wasn't the money, it was just the fact that I'd built this business from nothing uh, to the world's largest jewelry business. And I thought, through doing things which, you know, over 20 years, which I was so proud of, and I was proud of all the people that I employed, and here I was, through a stupid bloody joke that I lost it all. So I was miserable as hell, and I went to a psychiatrist, and she actually prescribed Prozac, or Siroxac, as it was then. Uh, and that was the worst thing for me, because that actually meant that just when I needed to get back on my feet, because of the depression and because of these pills that I was taking, I lost the sharpness. Yes, I felt better, I was no longer depressed, but I wasn't capable of fighting back, getting on my feet. So that was the big mistake. And what I did instead, because I had to pass the day, I was unemployable. I bought myself a bike. And to this day, I cycle, including this morning, I cycle 25 miles every day. And I feel to, and that was, that dealt with my depression. I'm not saying that's a solution to everybody. Sometimes pills help. They didn't help me get back on my feet. Exactly the reverse. I became a bit of a glump. I couldn't really have any conversation. But the cycling sharpened me up. And I have my best ideas now on the bike. Just like over the snooker table, I do believe, you know, you're thinking clearer uh, when you're out of the office, you have your best ideas. And that's what I do on a bike. And, and, they, and the bike saved me to a certain degree. Well, thanks, thanks for your honesty. Pleasure. And, um, there's a lot to be said for hard physical exercise. Definitely. And, and to buy a bike, yeah. <laughs> I, remember, I remember someone telling me about idea generation and uh, creativity, probably at a time where I maybe wasn't that confident in my own ideas and creativity. <laughs> And he said, um, ideas always come to you. You just have to empty your mind to let them come in. And it, I, that got me to look at it a different way. Because normally you're trying to think, you know, make things happen or whatever. Or you, you're a bit stressed and you're trying too hard. He said, you've got to do the opposite. You've got to empty your mind. Exactly. Uh, and cycling and snooker. and um, It's weird. Like playing pool. I've just started playing pool again. I used to play a lot when I was a kid. And when you, all you focus on is the ball that you're hitting... Everything else, the worries, the problems, the challenges, and it's just gone because you just focused on that. And you could do that and have a chat and do that and have a chat. So I, I think um, there's a lot to be said for merging your passion profession. And entrepreneurs, you know, hustlers, people who work really hard, they tend to not have the best balance. So you tend to work a lot, and then all the things that you loved to do years ago, you don't do anymore. I guess when Jared, Jared was at the peak of his... Uh, career, he wasn't cycling as much as he, you know he does now. Probably didn't have as much balance as many holidays or whatever. So it's important to take that balance. All right, great. So next question, uh, we'll come to the front here. What's your name? Alex. Okay, so microphone's coming to Alex. Hi, Alex. Hi. Hi, Alex. Hi. Um, my question to you is that retail has really changed over the time I've worked in it. Where do you see the high street going in five years' time? Nowhere. <laughs> Sorry to be negative, but it's just cannot compete. Um, you know, the internet is just growing and growing. There's no reason on earth I, I can think of why that isn't going to carry on. So when I started, just to show my age, all there was was the high street. It was very simple. If I wanted to take a shop, I would just take it between Marks and Spencers, 
and boots, and you knew you were going to have people walking past. Now it's much more complicated. We then had the shopping mall, then we had the out of town, and all these things were very, very attractive, probably more so than the high street, because they, you had parking, uh, you, had, you weren't walking around in the pouring rain, you know, out of town and malls like that. And now you've got the internet, which basically, you know, people at like Amazon are getting better and better at it, and their service is getting better. And when you buy something, uh, from the internet, you actually, this is a ridiculous thing, you probably get better service. Because if you want to buy a laptop, you know, you can read about every single thing that it does. You go into Curry's and ask the bloke behind the thing about a laptop, he won't, you know, he won't, he, he'll, he'll have a hidden agenda, he'll try and sell it to you, you won't, you know. So it is inevitable that the weakest <coughs> player in all of those parts is the high street. And that is. I believe is going to just disappear and become more residential. It's already starting now. I don't see how it how it can survive. Quite honestly, um, I could be wrong. Um, you know, governments like David Cameron brought in Mary Portis to try and she thought they should solve the whole problem. I mean, it was like moving the deck chairs on the Titanic. It's just absolutely hopeless because it's inevitable that people are going to just spend more time on their phones and and, and buy that way. I don't think, and, and I said this a long time ago. That, I mean, I went into the internet business in 2001, 2002, when it was very unfashionable. Now I believed in it. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, next, uh, we'll go right to the back. The gentleman with the scarf. What's your name, sir? Hi, uh, it's Nelson. Hi, Nelson. Hi, Nelson. Um, apart from avoiding saying the wrong thing in a speech. Uh, what other advice do you have for people uh, starting up a business? Um, well, the thing is that you're saying that apart from saying the wrong thing in a speech, what's advice for people starting off in business? Well, you might want to say the wrong thing in a speech because, you know, you've got publicity out of it. Um, it you, 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 the thing is that I played the, the media. They knew it. And if I hadn't played the media, I never would have got into that trouble in the first place. Um, if I'd have kept away from it, uh, then I wouldn't have been a target for them because nobody would know what I was. But some people, you know, say things that are totally ridiculous, like Michael O'Leary, Ryanair, very clever. You know, he says things that we're going to introduce, uh, you're going to have to pay for the lavatory, and then he said that, uh, you know, he's going to cut down on staff, so if there's a crash, the stewardesses can drive the plane and stuff like that. The most ridiculous, outrageous things... Um, Everyone thought he was mad, but in fact, all that did was generate more publicity and actually create something for him, which was that the Ryanair is the cheapest, because it must be the cheapest if you're going to have to pay for the lavatory and all those sort of things. It's all to do with, he, he, he's very clever, he had a very hidden agenda there. He was getting across the whole time that Ryanair is so cheap, with all of those jokes and things like that. So sometimes you do need to um, have a publicity stunt, if you like, uh, to launch a business. Because everybody wants to launch a business and nobody gets heard. So if you want to cut through the clutter, do something outrageous. Uh, do something that will get you in the... These people are always put in the paper and people think they're complete idiots. They're not always. You know, they, they, sometimes it works for them. So the advice of starting a business, um, I think that you have to be an expert at what you're doing. And that's, that's the thing. There's too many people that going into business thinking the internet's a panacea or I can make money and probably like that. They don't know the first thing. And I think it's very boring, but at the end of the day, I think you have to be basically good at what you're doing. Do you remember yesterday I drew the Venn diagram? Do you love it? Are you good at it? Is there a market for it? Can you monetize it? Love, talent, skill, market, money. If you've got all of those, you've got the, there's a Chinese word, begins with I and ends in I, Hideki, or some kind of word. Ikigai. That's the Ikigai, I told you it begins in I and ends in I. <laughs> Didn't know the other letters in the middle, but that doesn't make any difference. Hey mate, you should run this fucking seminar, you're on fire. <laughs> um, so then you've got that sweet spot. Now you can run good businesses, maybe missing one of those, but it's probably like trying to drive a car with three wheels. Okay, so we'll come over to this side for a question. So we'll take one over. But before we do, um, 
I believe so much in Gerald's book that I made him an offer to publish it on Audible. Because um, I read the book in 2000, and I think it was six, uh, when I read the book. And I remember very vividly when I read the book, because I just thought, what a great book. Um, I think we were just starting to go through some challenges, because we had a, quite a few staff at that point, and hadn't had staff before. Gone from like naught two mum and mum, to like maybe ten staff quite quickly, and I, I was, I'm not a very good manager at all. Uh, I didn't know how to do that, and so I was having some challenges, so I read Gerald's book. Um, and I remember mentoring someone, and he was trying to finance a property, and the finance got pulled right at the last minute, and he was really angry. And he started sort of trying to blame me and, and, and Mark a bit for it, because, you know, we'd advised him badly and blah, blah, blah. And it wasn't the case, but we were there to help him. And he lives in Newcastle, and I gave him your book. I think he's, he's subsequently messaged you to say how it changed his life. And he, and he got on the train from Peterborough and he read the whole book by the time he got to Newcastle. And he messaged me, he went, I completely know why you gave me that book. I haven't really got problems. And he bought 35 properties in the next three years and built his portfolio and retired. Um, and, you know, like, yeah, okay, I gave him the book, but Gerald wrote the book. Uh, and it's in my top 10 best books I, I, I've ever read. So, um, but he didn't have it on Audible. Um, and, you know, most people in our community now listen to audiobooks as opposed to read them. So just recently, literally, it was launched a few weeks ago, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, we finally got Gerald's book on Audible after all this time. Of course, it's been updated since he first wrote it. But um, I think the world needs to hear that book. Uh, I'm, I'm so, I so want to put the message out there of Gerald's book that I'm going to make you and everyone watching live an offer which is if you get the book on Audible now, so you need to get your phone out and you get it now, Gerald has kindly donated his time and he's going to do a day's event for you where he's going to be the keynote speaker. He'll do the rest of his speech you've not seen because there's another hour of it, which is amazing. Obviously, you saw 20 minutes of it and how good he is. He'll do another extended q and I'm going to be doing a talk on how to build your empire, which is my highest downloaded podcast of last year, how to build your empire. Because I don't think people, you know, a lot of people want this sort of piddly part-time incomes, but I think there's also a lot of people like us that actually want to build something that lasts, that matters, that, you know, we're not just looking to make a quick buck, we're look, looking to build something meaningful and do something meaningful. So if you get his audio book now, that includes you watching and all of you in the room, you get the audio book and before you go, you just show Joe or Abby or Ellie or Josh your receipt, you know, your screenshot that you've got his audio book. And we're going to be having the, the event in this room. So max we can take is about 200. So it'll be the first 200 or so. Um, there's 30,000 people that follow this page that are, 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 are living in at the moment. Um, so yeah, get your phone out. Get his audio yeah. book. If you've already got his video, physical book, get his audio book. I can see people waving their phone already. They're trying to shake the internet in Peterborough to make it work. <laughs> um, and yeah, we will give you... You know, Gerald's donated his time, I'll donate my time. And um, the, the business, the event will be focused on scaling your business. So it's called, you know, an, an empire building business event. So um, I think it's a great offer. So again, if you're watching on the live or on the recording of the interview, you just need to show me below somehow that you've got the audio book, the reference number or the image or something like that. Yeah, so do that right now. And while we're doing that, we'll take the next question. We'll come down. Sorry, there's a count. You already got it. If, have you got the physical book? No. Go get the physical book then. Whichever copy you haven't got. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mate, it's only a tenner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if you've already got one of the copies, get the other copy. You could have bought it 12 years ago. Yeah. Um, all right, brilliant. So actually, yeah, if, you want, if you'd rather have the physical book, I'll count that as well. Why not? Of Gerald Ratner, yeah, as opposed to all the other books Gerald Ratner's not written. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only playing. Yeah, yeah, it is that one. The Rise and Fall and Rise Again. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we're going to take a question from this side. Uh, I've been strictly told we have to finish in 11 minutes by Abby. It will kill me if not. So we're going to right in the corner to the lady in blue. Microphone. What's your name? Hello, my name's Denise. Hi, Denise. Hi, Denise. Hi, Denise. Hi Gerald. Lovely to meet you. And you. Um, when you started your online business, yeah. um, did you did you go on courses or did you leverage it out? How did you start? Because you're not young. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah, well, I started 
birthday in 2003. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was still old then. <laughs> I knew nothing about the internet. Right. Okay. Everybody said, keep clear of it, because we just had the bubble burst, if you remember, the stock market collapsed yeah. at the turn of the century because of the tech, and the people at Boohoo went bust, and they, everyone had lost a fortune yeah. in tech. And everybody said to me, don't go near it, it's a disaster. And that was exactly the reason why I decided that I wanted to do it, because I always want to do something that is unfashionable, not what everybody else wants to do. I also appealed to me uh, because of the fact that I could see that the landlords are squeezing the retailers, rents were going up, it was becoming very expensive to bring your product to the customer, and this appealed to me because I could s lower my prices and sell the product, you know, much lower price, because I didn't have all the overheads, the high rents that I had in the past, all the security costs, staff, everything like this. And when I started, I, my marketing cost on Gerald Online was 3%. Now, unfortunately, because Google has a monopoly, we're being squeezed now on the internet. And my marketing costs are 25%. So I can no longer be as cheap as I was in 2003 because I've got higher costs. But I could just see, I just felt that the internet... Uh, was the future. I just everything about it ticked the boxes and uh, that's why I got it got in very early. Thank you so much. When you listen to Gerald's book you yeah. notice so it's probably again this is said four or five times he likes to model what works. So you know, he's modeled online businesses, he's modeled good uh, jewelry businesses. Uh, Sam Walton who's very famous with Walmart used to go in competitor stores all the time and scope out what they were doing. And um, yes, I think you want to be unique and have your own flavour and values, and yeah, it's nice to innovate, but sometimes it's hard to innovate all the time. You know, Apple's aren't innovating, Apple aren't innovating like they were since Steve Jobs passed away. Um, but even with things like Apple products, if, you know, the touch screen with the finger wasn't designed by them, the mouse, mouse wasn't designed by them, a lot, you know, the, the computer wasn't designed by them. They often take something that's already proven to work and they make it better, more intuitive, more usable, they scale it. And I think often people think in business you've got to be really creative, create new stuff, you've got to innovate by changing the world with something that's never seen before. But actually, you know, those things, what do they call them? Unicorns, you know, they're, they're very rare. Often innovation, what are they doing? Okay, I, I think I can do that slightly better or slightly faster or I can make it slightly cheaper. That's also innovation. All right, cool. Uh, we'll go back to this side. So the man with the gloves, the lady with the gloves. Sorry. It looked like no, 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 you don't know. It looked like the man had his hand up. <laughs> What's your name? Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Uh, quick question leading off of the question that was just asked. You said that if it all went a bit pear shaped, you'd just start again. So what would you do now if you were to start your business again? Bearing in mind you don't like to do things that everybody else is doing that are following the trend. Yeah, I think that uh, Rob's right. I think you don't get any prizes for inventing the wheel again. It's very simple. You look at a business that is successful and you think, that's where I want to go. I started Ratners. Ratners was going nowhere for years. I know it ended up going nowhere, but it was, you know, it did become the world's largest group. And it was a complete disaster at one stage. Everything we sold was too expensive. It was exactly the same as everybody else. And I saw there, there were two shops that were doing particularly badly. One was in Newcastle and one was in Sunderland. And I went up to this, these, to see why we were doing so bad, because I was told that there was this guy called Robert Anthony who was up there, who was, had queues outside his shop the whole time. And I thought, what's he doing? So I went up there, and he, sure enough, at 8 o'clock in the morning, we were empty all day, he had a queue outside his shop, people waiting to get in. And what was he doing? Basically, he had posters all over the windows, he didn't have diamond rings in the windows, he had chains up front, earrings, everything he was screaming, pop music, and he just changed everything the way that we knew about selling jewellery. And it really upset everybody because all the traditional jewellers hated that sort of thing. It was all built on prestige and chandeliers. But he was taking the money. 
So we came back to London, we completely changed, and we did an operation exactly like him. So the answer to your question is, I would copy somebody, I would look out at somebody, and, and I would copy them, but what I'd also do, I would use the method I used for the health club that you heard about, whereas I wouldn't, however clever you are, eight out of ten new businesses fail. So I would try and put my foot in the water to try and test it without spending a huge amount of money. I think that that, you know, you can get, with my health club, I could have had marketing, I could have done demographics, I could have got every single which way to see whether it was worth opening a health club in Henley, but I didn't do any of that. I actually sold memberships for the club that didn't exist. And if, it didn't, if we didn't sell any members, I would have walked away. So that was the acid test. So yes, I'd co copy somebody who's, uh, who's got a good idea, don't mind doing that, but B, I would try and then start it up without spending any money. And then once it was successful, I'd then start throwing money at it. Something I would, if I was starting again, I'd, I'd definitely get in the digital marketing, the digital space. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, if you know how to run Facebook ads campaigns to your own products and services, you, bec you could become a digital agency and you can run Facebook ads for many other people and you just copy the system that you're using uh, and you put a, a 10 to 20% margin on what they spend as your revenue. And that costs zero to start. It doesn't cost you any money. You just need an access to, to a computer and their credit card. Um, podcasting, if you have your own podcast like I do, start um, hosting an other people's podcasts and promoting other people's podcasts. In two or three years, there's gonna be maybe even millions of podcasts. And if you host someone's podcast and you do maybe a bit of marketing for them and you get an outsource to do the editing and you make 200 pounds net a month per podcast and you, you have 20 or 30 podcasts on your books, you've got a really decent passive income and then you've, got a, a, then you've probably got a media company um, so I think, do you remember I said uh, yesterday how our media is being decentralised and where you, you had the BBC radio and BBC TV and now you've got YouTubers who've got millions of followers who aren't even 21 and you've got podcasters who get 100 million downloads a month like Joe Rogan who's, yeah, he's become a celebrity but he's in a comedian come UFC commentator. So I think the, the digital space is where you can do a lot of testing for virtually nothing and you don't need any overhead. So definitely do that. So we've got time. We've got two minutes left. So we've got time for probably two more questions. Just before that, if you're just tuning in live, because the numbers are going up and up and up, uh, I've made an offer. You want to be quick on this for Gerald's book, his audio book, The Rise and Fall and Rise Again of Gerald Ratner. If you grab a, an audio copy on Audible, um, this room here has got, well, we've got about 220 seats out here. Um, we're going to run an event with Gerald as the keynote speaker. He's going to do his keynote speech, which is amazing, and the Q&A. And I'm going to do a talk on um, building your business empire. So you just need to get an audio book. Show me somewhere in the thread that you've got the copy with a code or an image. And you're in. I did see some people going and showing the team at the back there, so you'll probably have to be quick. All right, what's your name at the back, sir, with the glasses? Yes? Uh, hi, my name's Ru. Hi, Ru. Hi, Ru. Hi, Ru. Hi. Uh, I'd like to know your opinion. Uh, when uh, observing you both on the stage, from both of you, I get a sense of, uh, of uh, confidence, of status, and dominance. And I see that with most successful and uh, wealthy people. I'd like to know how much of it is nature, how much of it is nurture, things like books, mentors, maybe martial arts, and well made me or may not. And how much of it is a direct result of becoming wealthy? 39 years ago when I was born, I couldn't speak. Really, yeah, yeah. Are you glad you tuned in on a Sunday night for that? So every, if whatever skill you perceive I have on the stage as a speaker is learned, not born. And um, actually, I was watching Becoming Warren Buffett. This is very interesting. Do you know what Warren Buffett hangs on his wall in his office, as pride of place. He says it, watch the documentary, he, it follows him. He, he's got his father's picture who he loved dearly, and then he's got one thing on his wall, not his degree, not his master's degree, not all the things he's achieved, not the Fortune 500, all that. His public speaking certificate from the Dale Carnegie speaking course he did. And he said the speaking courses he did changed his life, richest man in the world. And he also said, he then did as like a, as a sort of, he did an ongoing speaker thing. So he did a course, but then he was doing it once a week with the Carnegie Institute. 
And he said, back then, if you, if you won the Speaker of the Month, you got a pencil. And he said his happiest week of his life was that week because he won a pencil and he got engaged to his wife. <laughs> I mean, he's a very, um, he's a lovely, amazing man, Warren Buffett. Um, talk to him like he's my mate, you know. Um, so, so, whatever you perceive we can do as a speaker is learn. You learn to speak. How many speeches have you done, Gerald? Oh, about 3,000. <laughs> but um, I'm changing it a bit now because I'm getting a bit bored with it. <laughs> I do love to listen to my own voice. But, and unfortunately, I'm a one trick pony because, you know, when I do a speech, people want to hear about my downfall. I can't, it's the elephant in the room, which I just can't avoid. So it's difficult uh, for me to, you know, do something different. Um, I was asked actually the Cornwall Business Awards to do a speech and they said it was so good they'd like me to come back uh, the following year on the condition that I do a completely different speech. So I thought, okay, well they offered me a lot of money, I'll do this. So I went back <laughs> there and in the end I did exactly the same speech because I, I really couldn't come up with a new one. And they sent me an email uh, a week afterwards saying that thank you so much for doing that speech and making the effort to change it completely <laughs> last year. So I realised at that point a lot of people don't listen to me anyway. So. <laughs> but I do enjoy it. I do, I've, the only down, with all this disasters people say to me, um, do you regret saying what you said? And I said, God, do I regret it? Yeah, of course I do. Here we are talking about it 26 years later. But the only good thing that's come out of it, apart from meeting Rob and people like him, is that uh, I love doing the speeches, which I would never have done if I hadn't made that terrible mistake at the Albert Hall. So there's always a silver lining. Do you remember what we were talking about assets yesterday? Well, Gerald has built his speech as his asset. It's just in the same... It's like renting out a property 3,000 months with what he's done, because, you know, he's, he, he commands a really good fee, so he's just turned it into an asset. So I think as you do more speaking gigs on stage, you do get more confident. And I think when you start, you tend to overact a bit, and I think you come across as confident when you, when you feel comfortable and natural on stage. And in the early years, I was probably modelling the Americans... So I probably was overacting a little bit. And that, a lot of that was nerves, because I'm doing something that's uncomfortable. And then when you've done enough speeches, Gerald will tell you, so many things happen and so many things go wrong, so much so that you've seen it so much that it's actually you don't mind it anymore. Because your biggest fear of a speaker is you, you go completely blank and you've got nothing to say and everyone's looking at you, or something goes wrong and everyone's looking at you, but... When it's happening, I mean, I remember I was in the Property Super Conference in front of 17, 700 people. And I, back then, I used to wear really tight Italian suits. I can't quite pull them off anymore, but really tight Italian suits. And I dropped the clicker, and I went like that, and it ripped. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, I had my striped and Deschamps boxer shorts on at the time. Um, I've fallen over on the stage. I've been heckled on the stage. I nearly got... <laughs> nearly got a bit of action on the stage. You know, it's all hard to swear in front of 11 year olds. You know, it's like, yeah, and, and, and then you just think, well, you know what? I might as well just be myself and have fun. Cool, and we've got that one more question, so we're going to go to Corinne. The microphone's coming to you. It's a final question. Thanks for tuning in as well, live on your Sunday evening. 4 3 Liverpool. <laughs> Well, what I'd like to be known for is pretty irrelevant because on my gravestone, <laughs> as Spike Milligan said on his gravestone, that, you know, I told you I was ill. Um, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, on my gravestone will be the bloke um, who called his jewellery crap, which actually is not Excuse true because I didn't, as Rob was very kindly reminds a lot of people, but it's not much point in arguing the toss about it, um, I accept by implication that if you call, make a joke about one of your products that everyone thinks everything you've said is crap. So, um, yeah, I will be known for that crap. I mean, it's, it's annoying when you Google Gerald Ratner and it comes up Gerald Ratner crap, you know. So <laughs> I don't know how you'd feel about that um, if that happened to you. But I've lived with it, you know. And uh, I can look myself in the mirror and I think, well, I haven't done anything that bad. I made a joke 21 years ago 
um, when Boris Johnson was fighting the um, EU election, the, the Brexit thing, he wanted to call David Cameron, he wanted to insult David Cameron. And what did he do to, you know, the worst thing he could think of, he called him the Gerald Ratner of politics, you know? And the next day in the Sunday Times, Boris Johnson was quoted saying, we've got to stamp out this Ratnerism. Um, I made a joke about a sherry decanter 26 years ago, give me a break, you know? But I can't get away from it. So what I've done is I've done 3,000 speeches about it. I've used it to try and push my jewelry business, push my gym, and to try and turn uh, that negative into positive. And, I can, and I've succeeded in doing that. And if I can succeed in turning the biggest corporate disastrous gaffe of all time into a positive, then you can turn around any disaster that happens in your life.